Hello everyone, welcome back to our second video in our series on analyzing Shakespearean sonnets. And today we're going to look at sonnet 18, the sonnet that we used last time to analyze the form, meter, and rhyme scheme of Shakespearean sonnets. So on the next slide I'm going to read through this sonnet aloud and then we'll break it down more in depth. Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. The first thing we want to do then in terms of analyzing Shakespearean sonnets is to determine the theme. And we do this by breaking down each stanza and recalling from the last video what each stanza is trying to tell us. And we said that that first stanza in the Shakespearean sonnet is going to set the stage for the topic that the speaker will be discussing. And here, Shakespeare uses language that's very down to earth and understandable in comparison to other more difficult sonnets. And he's simply comparing his audience to a summer's day. And you'll see in parentheses here that I've given two options for who this audience might be, either the fair youth that we discussed in our last video or Shakespeare's son, who died prematurely. And we'll get more into that debate in a moment. So I understand the topic of the sonnet overall. Now I need to jump to my next stanza, that second quatrain. And I know that this is where the speaker is going to dive more in depth into how he is discussing this topic. So how does he begin to compare his audience to A Summer's Day? And here we see that he's talking first about the drawbacks of A Summer's Day, so the negative qualities. And in particular, we need to remember that Shakespeare is writing from a context of an English background. So he's not talking about A Summer's Day that we would find here in Lebanon, but A Summer's Day that would be very typical of English weather. Now that I understand what angle he's taking in this second stanza, I then need to look to my third stanza, that third quatrain. And here we said that the speaker is going to continue to discuss this central topic more in depth, but then there's going to be this twist or this complexity that he adds to it. And here we see that this twist or complexity is the fact that he now looks at the positive qualities of his audience in comparison to A Summer's Day and that this twist we see is the eternal beauty of the person he is speaking to. That this beauty will never fade despite the ravagings of time. And then finally, I turn my attention to that final stanza, that couplet. And as we discussed, that couplet is going to be either a resolution to a problem that's proposed, clarity on an idea that the speaker is working through himself, or an answer to a question that he's posed. And here we see that this couplet acts as a solution to the issue of mortality, right? That although time will steal the beauty and the youth of everyone, this is not true for the speaker's audience. That they, in fact, will gain eternal life and eternal youth through the sonnet itself. Now that I've successfully determined the theme that I believe Shakespeare is discussing, I'm going to turn to each stanza and analyze it verse by verse to see if the theme that I have identified I can adequately support with evidence from the poem itself, that evidence being either sound devices that I see or figurative language being used. So I'm going to take a look at this first stanza, and two things really stand out to me. The first is this use of a rhetorical question. So Rhetorical questions are a persuasive technique that we use, not because we want the answer to the question itself, but rather because we want to persuade our audience either that this question is important to ask or that the answer is so obvious there's really no need to address it. So when I look at the question that he is asking, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, I'm really 
using this to understand that it's not that the speaker is in doubt of the audience and the beauty that they have in comparison to the summer's day. It's more of this question of why even bother trying to make this comparison because you are far more beautiful than a summer's day itself. And the second thing that I want to clarify or pick up on is in this first line, the stress that I place, or in this sense, don't place on that first syllable. Because remember, we're breaking down Shakespeare's sonnets in terms of iambic pentameter. And while there is some contention or argument as to whether this first verse really fits into that iambic pentameter, I think we can safely say that it does. Because when we're asking ourselves this question, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Remember, we're saying he's not asking this question because he's in doubt. So it's not shall I, but shall I, meaning should I even bother going into this comparison at all? Because I know, and by extension, my audience knows that you are far, far more beautiful than a summer's day. And the next thing I'm going to look at okay, is this word thou. And I'm drawing your attention to this for two things. One, when we see this word, okay, it's an old English way of saying you, okay? So I could replace thou art more with you are more lovely, okay? And here, this is also interesting because Shakespeare is speaking directly to his audience, so either that fair youth or his, his son who's recently deceased. Then I'm going to take a look at the rest of the verse and see that Shakespeare makes use of repetition. You are more lovely than a summer's day. And he continues with, you are more temperate. And temperate meaning mild, tempered, or consistent. So for any of you who have been to England or you've heard about their weather, they're very famous for having weather that is not very lovely, <laughs> in fact. So talking about the fact that in comparison to a summer's day, you are far more lovely, and this loveliness that you have is consistent. It's not one day it's there and the next that it's gone. You are consistently this beautiful person. Then Shakespeare continues with this metaphor that he's making. You know, so rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. So on a literal level, right, sometimes the weather in England during the summer is not calm at all. You have these rough winds that are shaking these signs of spring, those darling buds of May. But we're also looking at this in terms of personification, right? The wind is given this power to physically shake and to change and to alter. So it's not something that's idyllic. It's not this beautiful, happy summer. Instead, it's something more tumultuous, yeah, inconsistent. And again, I see that this metaphor is continuing yeah and summer's lease hath all too short a date and this is meaning on a literal level english summers or the type of weather that you would like to have when you're there it's not around very long so here again recalling from my previous slide i'm determining that in this first stanza the speaker is drawing my attention to a summer's day and letting me, the reader, understand that they are going to be making this extended metaphor throughout the rest of the sonnet. In this next stanza, then, I'm going to dive into all these negative qualities that the speaker is going to identify in terms of the summer. And the first thing that the speaker identifies is this, this idea of an inconsistent quality to summer. So sometimes it's too hot. It's simply too warm in the eye of heaven shines and here this is a reference to the sun so the speaker is simply saying that sometimes the summers in england they're in fact too warm and this sun shines much too bright and this inconsistency then continues into the next verse so sometime it's too hot but then often right his gold complexion is dimmed and this his here is important because we're treating again this summer as not just an extended metaphor for comparing um, summer to the audience, but also summer as representing others. So all of those who are in fact not the speaker's intended audience. And here he's simply saying that the weather in summer can turn very quickly. It's not consistent or mild right, or temperate 
like the audiences. And this is important to understand because here I'm also understanding on that deeper level that he's not just talking about the summer, he's talking about the beauty of others and that with time, right, that beauty will fade. Turning again to the next verse, he's saying something very similar, right? Fair from fair, some time declines. This is interesting. One, we have this internal rhyme going on. So this time and decline rhyme with one another. But also here the speaker is drawing our attention to the fact that no one can escape the damage of time. Turning then to my last verse, I see nature's changing course untrimmed. And here we have another instance of personification where the speaker is giving human-like qualities to nature and saying that nature itself has the ability to take away or to steal the beauty of others. And that's what this word untrimmed means, okay? This ability to take away or to diminish the beauty of others. Then I come to my third stanza, my third quatrain, where I begin to see the positive qualities of the audience, either that fair youth or Shakespeare's deceased son. And you should notice this one, but thy. So here Shakespeare's drawing his attention away from summer and from the discussion of others and directing it specifically to his audience. He begins to speak straight to them, saying that their eternal summer shall not fade. And if you're paying attention in the last stanza, we already understand that summer is being used as a metaphor for beauty. And so while the beauty of others fades, the beauty of the audience member won't, it can't, because it has this eternal quality, it never perishes. Then we move to the next two verses and we see this repetition being used. Repetition specifically of this word nor, and this is used in a sense as a command by the poet. So the poet is saying that you will not lose possession or ownership of the beauty that you have. Fair being a synonym for beauty and ois meaning to own. And this continues then in the next verse, just as they won't lose ownership of their beauty, death also will not be able to brag that the beauty of the lover has been taken by it, has been changed or altered by death. And this is significant because then we also have this continued use of personification. In this instance, personifying death, that they will not be able to capture any of the beauty of the fair youth or Shakespeare's son depending upon how you analyze his intended audience. Then I turn to the last verse in this stanza. And here Shakespeare is saying, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So these eternal lines referring to history, right? There's a time before we were born, during our life, and time will continue after we die. So Shakespeare is saying that in this eternal line of history, so even after your death has come, yeah? your beauty will not fade. And finally, I've reached the last stanza in my sonnet, this couplet. And here I continue to see a use of repetition. Here, the repetition of the phrase, so long. And whereas our first instance of repetition was a command by the poet, now we have a promise that the poet is making. And the promise is twofold. So first, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, meaning so long as humanity exists, you will also exist. And this is beautiful imagery. Shakespeare, in one sense, is so well known and so renowned because of his amazing use of language. And here he is not just saying so long as we are alive, so long as men can breathe, as long as we have life, or the fact that we can see, that we can take in the beauty around us. And this moves us to our second promise from the poet. So long lives this, referring to the sonnet that we are reading, the sonnet that he writes. And this gives life to thee. So we've come full circle now. So in the beginning of the sonnet, we see that the audience is the reason behind the sonnet. They've given life to the idea of it, but now, Shakespeare ends with a promise to them. Just as you have given life to my sonnet, my sonnet will continue to give life to you long after you are gone. So now it's time to piece everything together. So my first step, you'll recall, was identifying each of those stanzas and what theme was being communicated. 
and then jumping back to each particular verse in the stanza to see if there's evidence to support my theme. And now I'm coming together and I'm going to think through using my notes and I'm going to try to understand, have I accurately identified the theme of the poem? And the central theme that we drew out at the beginning was this idea of the transient nature of beauty. This idea that beauty is not long lasting, except in the case of the speaker's audience. And we see that a solution is provided for this. So the speaker will be able to preserve the beauty of their audience through the poem and hence help them escape the, the trappings of death. And I see that this is exemplified through the use of that extended metaphor in comparing the audience to an English summer's day. So while a summer day in England is often too hot, the sun shines too much, the wind is too rough, the audience member, their beauty, right? Because remember, summer is being used in this entire sonnet as a metaphor for beauty is consistent. And I see that this firmly establishes the superior beauty of my audience in comparison to others. And additionally, I see that Shakespeare has used figurative language throughout to both clarify and support the theme that I've identified. And this helps me understand that, yes, I have accurately chosen the theme and I've adequately found evidence to support that. So, for example, there's clear imagery of the unpredictability of summer versus the audience's consistent and eternal beauty. But also I see that the poet's tone towards his audience, love and affection that's seen throughout helps to solidify the theme of the audience being an exception to the declining nature of beauty. And this is also seen in the mood of the poem. So as we were reading and analyzing, we saw many examples of diction and imagery that help to create this peaceful and serene picture. So I'm going to use all of these to help confirm for myself that I have correctly identified the theme. So that's going to wrap us up for video number two. I just want to give you a brief preview for video number three. And in that, we're going to be analyzing sonnet 116. We're going to be doing the same process we did here. So I'm going to identify my themes first, go stanza by stanza to see if my evidence supports my themes, and also looking for literary devices to clarify that I have correctly identified it. And then at the end of that video, I'm going to give you a practice. So we would have gone through two sonnets together as a class, and then I'm going to post for you sonnet 138. And you're going to go through the same process we've done. I'll post a worksheet for you on Google Drive with a link uh, embedded in an agenda on lesson. So you're going to go through that on your own, and then video number four will be a solution to that uh, sonnet analysis. Okay. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for video number three.